like to call the uh, November 20th school committee meeting to order. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody early. Uh, tonight we'll have uh, our usual uh, consent agenda, re public input, reports, and then we'll we'll get here for a parent university update, uh, the first reading of uh, revised policy JICFB bullying prevention, and then the a calendar discussion and vote. Is there any public input or anything not on the agenda? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion on the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Can, can, I, can I remove yes. the October 30th minutes for just a tiny little typo? But can I remove those and do them separate? Sure. All those in favor of the consent agenda as amended. Very small thing, oh, may I? Yeah. On the October 30th minutes, um, I reported out on the Reading 375 committee celebrating the 375th anniversary. And it just That's says 275. Yeah, yeah. So if the committee were comfortable with that edit, I. That's my only suggestion. I second that edit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can we approve the minutes with that edit and Linda will update it? Yep. yep. So a motion to approve the minutes of the um, October 30th school committee meeting as amended by Ms. Sporowski. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. Mr. Block. Yeah. Those? No, just all <laughs> those in favor. <laughs> five, nice. Excuse me, five zero. Okay, now we'll have uh, reports. You have any I have a quick report, which Gina will probably add to, but we went to the um, 375 trivia night, and it was really fun. It was great. Um, really fun. I think there were 15 or so tables of six people there. Yeah. Um, there was great food. There was tons of great volunteer staff. The questions were fun. It wasn't, it was not v Reading trivia. There was some Reading trivia in there. And by the way, it's the Josh Wheaton Wildcats. We were trying to um, come up with the of all the, uh, actually, that was no, Woodend. Wood wood I mean, Josh sorry, Wheaton. yeah, Woodend yeah. wood wood was the one we were struggling. We, yep. we, I saw a, a car on the way here, and they had their Woodend Wildcats <laughs> on the back. One of the questions was, what was the mascot of Killam? <laughs> so, and you would have known. I had an in. Koala. And um, so, <laughs> it was really fun. So I highly recommend it. Uh, it's gonna, they're going to do it again in uh, the spring, they yep. said. And uh, I would highly recommend it. It was just great fun. Get yourself a table of six. Or you can just show up and join a table of people. So was it like the when we did that? What was it? Did you do that RCTV uh, time will tell? No, much and lower. Much set lower up by a question by the Board of Selectmen and lost. No. No, but we came Much in, lower stress. Our team did come in third place. <laughs> yep. Uh, we had uh, Ms. Sporowski and her husband and her son. Yep. And I had uh, my son and his girlfriend, both Reading High graduates. Yeah. And uh, we, we did come in third place, and it was a big runoff at the end. It was seven question tie. We were tied. Yep. The tie was really hard to break. It was a really fun event, and I, I would add that incredibly well attended, so I'm sure it was a successful fundraiser, but really fun to meet sort of different people that I only see at town meeting. And to get to socialize with them and have a few laughs, so yeah, it's it really fun. Right. It's a good group, so mm. I recommend it. I have a couple of reports. Um, one is there was a successful organizational meeting for Reading embraces diversity, and um, they had a sex successful event with the library kindness rocks. Um, the Reading Embraces Diversity and Human Relations Advisory Committee are co-sponsoring a uh, conversation with Dr. Anna Ornstein, who is a child psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor at Coolidge on November 29th at 7. We're hoping everybody will come, everybody will share the information that's going out there. Um, we'd really love it to be an animated, inclusive conversation about the um, comparison, compare and contrast, the 1930s in Europe before World War II and after with current day, what's happening in the current day. So it would be great if folks came. 
Um, also wanted to report on the success of Jams for Jake. Um, that was an amazing testament to our graduates of the Reading Public Schools because it was com the brainchild of our graduates and they brought it to fruition including meeting their fundraising goals and um, hiring bands and doing police um, details and Erica McNamara did herself again, freezing her toes off the entire day into the night with them. Um, it was a wonderful event to raise the awareness of addiction and a sensitivity to those who are suffering from addiction and creating a community of support for families who are grappling with um, family members. It was a great way, a great start towards preventing tragedies and the kids the kids are not kids anymore. The young adults are really motivated and talented. And a shout out to John Oliver and um, Lauren Anderson, Allison Steger, Michael Wandell, and a whole bunch of other graduates who did an awesome job. Um, and the bands were good too. Um, a shout out to Pippin, the cast of Pippin. It was an amazing, am I stealing your thunder? Oh, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I even um, I won't say much except it was a really complicated show to do <clears throat> and done incredibly well. And I'll call it the best team. I don't know, the show was amazing. It was so good. It went Friday night, blew me away completely. Yeah. So cool. And that's a real testimony to the hard work, teamwork, kids with different strengths working together on a team to make a production. And they have to work with adults to do it, but they have to work with a, each other. And um, just an incredible feat. And, and not all on the stage. Backstage, in um, the arts and graphics that they do, and yeah, it was, it was fundraising amazing. and everything. Right. Um, and oh, we have in the works, we have um, our two middle schools and our high school are bringing Anna Ornstein to do assemblies there as well. And that's actually in the works. I think we have a date and time. Coolidge is December 1st. And I think that Parker we have settled. I won't mention the date until it's all confirmed. Um, so that's, that's my. And we're working on the high school as well. Yes, we're working right on the high school. Yes. I have two quick reports. The audit committee met last week to look over, uh, to hear from the auditors on our MLD, the annual audit, and uh, two things of note for the committee. One is one that I think we're all aware of, that beginning soon, it's on the horizon, I think it's next year, but don't, it's coming up really soon, if not next year. There's gonna be a really significant change to accounting rules where the OPEB liability needs to be on the front balance sheet. So what's going to happen is there'll be a big ballooning um, of several million, million dollars in our liabilities. The only good news is the rule is going into effect for all municipal utilities and all municipalities at the same time. So it'll happen for us, but it'll happen for everyone. So anyone looking at those is going to see it consistently across the board. And we've known about it for years, and so I'm just a heads up that that change is coming and we're all prepared for it. Um, I did ask the question at the meeting how our funding of OPEB um, at RMLD kind of related to our peers, and our auditors felt it was really good, really <coughs> strong. Um, they generally how we are compared to peer yeah, the, 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 uh, we're paying it up at a rate that is respectable mm -hmm. relative to our peers. Um, the audit was clean, it was very strong, they were very happy with what they found, and in fact, they said in 50 to 70 percent of their um, similar audits that they do, they do a management letter, and they didn't for us, they didn't find anything um, worth leaving a note on. So it was a really strong audit, a very good, uh, very good meeting, but something to be proud of for sure. And my other update is a reminder to the community that the Reading Education Foundation is having its annual Festival of Trees the first weekend in December, the second and third. It's gonna be an amazing, fun event. They do an incredible job raising tens of thousands of dollars every year that directly support our schools. Um, so definitely get out and go to that. And um, I wanna <coughs> express my gratitude to the committee for your, uh, we have 100% participation, so thank you all for volunteering to support a tree. The school committee and central office will be supporting a tree and our theme will be the joy of learning. So it'll be a very fun um, celebratory tree. That's it. Caitlin, I'm very sorry. Oh, I don't worry about it. Go first. 
Um, not too much. Just the junior versus senior powder puff game is tomorrow night at the turf. Um, Wednesday, we have the early release and, of course, the pep rally. And then on Thanksgiving, there's the annual football game versus Stoneham, which is home this year in Reading at the turf starting at 10 a.m. That's it. Thank you. Great. Um, I thought I'd give a quick update about professional development, especially um, as you know, we had an in-service full day in-service on November 7th. Um, so I wanted to give the committee and the community an update. I know I'm not going to hit everything. We had so many different things going on, but I thought I'd give you a taste of some of the more larger gatherings. Um, at the elementary level, in, uh, we had several workshops going on to support our uh, literacy, specifically our writing goals. Um, our K-1 teachers were working with our consultant, Martha Horn, around the early writers development workshop. Um, and also our grades two and three teachers were working with our consultant Beth Moore for a Writers Workshop Institute, doing things like studying mentor texts for informational writing, um, analyzing samples of student writings, kind of calibrating expectations, um, creating tools for conferring with students about their informational writing, and so forth. That's been something that's been ongoing throughout the year, um, but it was nice to have a full day session with them. Um, we also had about 40 some high school teachers involved in a Keys to Literacy um, PD. Again, there's been several sessions to this um, PD. It's connected to our goal around um, reducing the achievement gap, closing that achievement gap, um, and a consolidation of levels. And one of the first topics that we've really been focusing on is the difference in reading skills. Um, that might struggle with reading or might have trouble accessing text. Um, so they looked at things like, and they are continuing to do this work with them, um, a tiered instructional model, how to deliver instruction at multiple levels to students with varying levels of literacy <coughs> skills in the classroom, um, the basic five components of reading and the difficulties that students with learning disabilities might have um, with those skills that affect their own comprehension, um, and really how to differentiate and scaffold provide all students, um, including those with learning disabilities, um, success in the inclusion classroom, and went over some key strategies to incorporate into their instruction. All of our reading specialists at the elementary level were working together, specifically just beginning taking a look at making sure they're more on the same page around our level literacy intervention, LLI um, components. We had teachers doing, and I kind of alluded to it when we were doing the MCAS <coughs> review or data review, um, doing their own analysis and review of our MCAS data, especially at the middle level. Um, we included social studies teachers in with the ELA because the literacy standards apply to that um, content as well. Um, and I was hearing great things from teachers about that because we really had a chance to collaborate and, and get into that. Um, let's see. I wanted to also mention, we hosted, and this was the first time this year, we hosted a, what was called a Next Generation STEM conference that was called TEACH, an acronym because everything has to be an acronym in education. <laughs> Technique exchange allows change to happen. And um, we had a number of our science teachers involved <coughs> in this. Overall, we had about 250 educators participating from around our region, other districts, um, and even some from other parts of the country. Um, I know there are people here from Wisconsin, Arizona, Montana. That's because it was completely sponsored by No Adam. Um, it wasn't about their program, but they, were, they had been very interested in bringing science educators and looking to expand it in future years, perhaps, mm -hmm. around the next generation standards and what that means. And so when we volunteer to host, that means we can do that for free. So that was a great opportunity to include a bunch of our educators in that. Um, it started off, it was sort of arranged like a mini conference um, with a general, a couple general sessions, um, speakers, and then breakout sessions on different topics like, and basically around the standards of good instruction, Socratic dialogue, reading strategies for content, um, lab planning, all the different things about the new standards. Um, they had a, a address by um, the DESE, 
representative on what, what some of the new standards in, in Massachusetts, um, how, how they apply to us. And also they had a guest speaker who was Tim Sager, called him the guest innovator, who is the executive vice president of engineering for iRobot. So that was that was nice. So was um, that all day? Was that the whole It was all day. It was a whole day, yeah. Yeah, they provided lunch for the people who participated and, and um, most of our science science so, and math teachers. So all of our grades four, five teachers and all of our middle level science teachers. This first time and we talked about that, even though they only stem it focused much more on science. But I think as they go forward that they'll be able to make it more of a STEM. Conference. What day was it on? That was November 7th also. All so that was on the 7th. election day? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. So it costs nothing for substitutes. Kids weren't here. Nope. It was nothing. And normally, all, all the other districts who said there was a registration <coughs> fee, but we didn't have to register any of our students because we were hosted. Any of your teachers? Hosted. I'm sorry, any of our teachers. Yeah. Because we were hosting the event. And, so, and, and they really took care of you know, Oh, and all, all of the things. teachers of ours that wanted to participate were able to? Mm -hmm. And our schools Excellent. would have been open anyways on that day. Yeah, so, so it's just, you know, sort of managing the logistics of, you know, what rooms are we going to use. They use the Performing Arts Center at certain times of the day. So it was just a matter of organizing that, but we were able to navigate that. Um, and then, of course, and I mentioned this last year, we had about 200, I think nearly 200 of our staff participate um, in the NPEN, is their acronym, is the Northeast Professional Educator Network. Um, and that's the collaboration of regional districts to provide professional development, especially to some of the specialized areas. Um, several years ago, districts realized that it's really a big challenge for all of us individually to offer mm -hmm. continually, consistently, high quality PD, especially to areas where there might be one of these members, you know, like a, a phys ed teacher, an art teacher, a, um, a school psychologist, and things like that. Or even an entire district is a smaller group, and so that's where they begun. So we had, you know, state vice, our, our paras, phys ed, um, guidance, music, art, um, foreign language, occupational physical therapists, speech language, um, our substantially separate special education teachers, library, media, technology, team chairs, things like that. Um, and so several of the, the districts now, it's, it's become pretty much a norm that they are collaboratively making November 7th. I mean, it's only a tr real impactful election day every couple of years, but just to make that a consistent in-service day because that way everyone is, has that day together and they're able to collaborate and provide that. Um, and so different plate um, locations provided, you know, um, the arts, music, and individual arts might be in one district. And uh, so, and that was worked really nice. It's really grown. They told me they total, they had over 2,000 the NPEN one? Yeah. yeah. And there is a slight cost, but it's, I mean, it's, it's minimal considering the results because everybody is collaborating on that. So it's, yeah. And no subs. And no subs. Yeah, so certainly no public expense for that. So yeah, I just thought it's important for the community to know that when we do have those days, there's a lot going on. And there's other things that I could have mentioned, but that was, that was a lot of what was happening on that day. So they would... Some teachers would be going out of district to other. Yep, I mean, there's some. So, how do we in, in keep track of that where everyone's going? So, they, they've um, registered. Um, there's signs they get um, certificates for being there and for achieving it. So, yeah, it's all coordinated among the districts. The lists are all shared and we've got those. Um, and it's usually pretty close districts. I mean, the kids are not traveling too far. Away. Don't they need to do a certain amount of yes. the certificate work in order to maintain their certification? Yeah. So, so this is also keeping all our teachers. All educators have to relicense, and you need a certain number of professional development points and different things, professional development hours to do that in different areas. And it's it's part of the responsibility of school districts to provide opportunities for teachers to do that at no cost to them. Um, and so this type of collaboration makes it more cost effective and certainly more effective to do that together. I, I, like the, oops, yeah. I like the idea that they're doing it together because they bring it back together. So they can, when they're trying to implement something, they're not alone. They can 
work out the kinks by sounding off with one another. Yeah, yeah. And you share the, the organization, you share the expense, you know, to say, say you're bringing somebody in, I mean, some of it's sharing with each other, but sometimes they're bringing in experts as well. And if you only have 10 people of a certain field in your district, you might not spend a certain amount of money, but if they want to contribute just a little bit, you're able to provide that type of professional development for a larger number. Much more so, yeah, and um, I've heard great things. We actually had a few of our teachers, I believe, in foreign language courses this year as well. So I'm hoping that will continue to grow. Thank you. Yeah. So was there a, some reason why didn't. Yeah. It's, a, it's a report. Yeah, yeah. no, I don't. Right, no, I just didn't know something. I was looking in the journey, sometimes stuff like that. It was also last week. Last week, yep. okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to give the committee a quick update coming out of town meeting last week. So very happy to report that the two capital items that we had put forth were both approved. So. Mm -hmm. The Wood End Skylight project was approved, so we met with Joe Huggins this afternoon. He is moving forward with getting all of the bid specification and documentation ready to go to be launched in December. Once that's completed, we will have him come back before the committee and give an update on the selection and next steps on that. And also, equally happy to report that Finance Committee as well as Town Meeting approved the additional 85000 capital for the district-wide um, wireless project that we are currently working on. So both of those were approved and we will be moving forward with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a few things. Um, some um, events that I was able to attend or I, I just want to highlight. So first of all, um, I want to highlight that uh, last week, uh, due to um, the generosity of the Reading Education Foundation, uh, we had internet technology safety expert Katie Greer come to during the day to present to both middle schools, um, and she also held a uh, evening event for the community. Um, Ms. Greer talks about um, several different te trends in technology. Um, in internet safety, and so talk to the students about social media, um, social uh, internet safety, uh, what it called digital tattoos, so making sure that you have a healthy footprint online. Um, case examples and real life implications, talks, talked about cell phones and smartphone devices and things to watch out for, sexting, cyberbullying, those are some of the topics that she addressed. Um, with both, so it was very well received um, by both the middle schools and by the by the community. And I want to thank the Reading Education Foundation for providing the funding for that. I also wanted to. You didn't talk about the seventeenth, right? I did not. Okay, so I just because um, Carolyn would have done this if she was if she was able um, to come. So we do ha did have some staff um, being conference day. We did have some staff that were involved in. Professional development. Uh, our paraeducators um, at all three levels were involved in different types of topics. So, at the preschool, elementary, and high school level, paraeducators received training on math and literacy instruction, inclusive practices, the many faces of autism, special education basics, underage substance abuse, and collaborative problem solving. Our nurses received training on 504 accommodations, which Carolyn provided, and our middle school teachers. Uh, continued the training that they received beginning at the at the beginning of the year on the Facing History and Ourselves curriculum. And I was able to spend some time at both middle schools uh, observing that training and I just continue to walk away being very impressed by the program and the types of activities that our students are going to be involved with during their advisory on this curriculum. Um, and I want to thank Carolyn uh, for organizing the bulk of this, um, these topics uh, for our paraeducators in particular. Um, it takes a lot to put together different workshops and not to duplicate workshops from previous years because our paraeducators have maybe already have had that. She worked with a group of paraeducators, um, kind of like a professional development committee of paraeducators to um, schedule these events. Um, and I know our, middle, our elementary principals were involved in 
some of the trainings as well. So I just want to thank Carolyn and the elementary principals for, for providing that training. Um, I also was able to attend, and I've had the opportunity to do this the last couple of years, um, what's called a National Letter of Intent Signing Day um, for some of our student athletes. So there were two separate days. Um, I was not able to attend one of the days, but I was able to attend the other one. Um, so uh, these, are, these are all seniors. Kevin Spear uh, signed a National Letter of Intent for Swimming to attend Drexel University next year. Jack Geiger signed a National Letter of Intent for Lacrosse to attend UMass Amherst next year. And Ben Brungard signed a National Letter of Commitment to play baseball at UMass Amherst. Um, I was able to attend Kevin and Ben's signing. Um, it's a really special event where they sign their letter of intent for the university that they're going to be going to. The family is there, their friends are there, um, it was, and their coaches are there. It was a really a nice event. So I want to congratulate the families on this um, accomplishment and also congratulate the coaches who coach these student athletes over the last four years. Um, it's, it's well, well received. Um, I want to go in a little bit more detail on what I reported out last week or two weeks ago on the Massachusetts School Building Association school survey report um, because I think we, we received a couple of questions about this report so I just want to clarify some things um, based on the report. The report is online. Uh, if you Google MSBA um, school survey report 2016, it's online. Um, so the whole purpose of the survey, the last time the survey was completed was 2010. The survey was completed in 2016. And it should be noted that this is one of many tools that MSBA uses when they're assessing any applications for funding for either um, school building projects, renovations, <coughs> or repair projects. So it's just one piece of the data that they use. For Reading, seven of the eight schools were surveyed. As I mentioned, the last time Wood End was not um, because it was built as a new school in 2007. Um, and no schools were surveyed that were built in the last 10 years as, as brand new um, structures. Each building was given a rating on a scale from one to four, one being the highest, four being the lowest, for two categories, building condition and general environment. So. I want to go into a little bit more detail of the two sets of ratings, um, which I did not do the last time. So all Reading schools received a rating of one for the general environment condition. So what does this mean? The categories in this rating include learning environment, which is space and educational quality, building condition rating, cleanliness and maintenance, building safety, which includes school security and fire life safety, universal accessibility, which is your site accessibility and building accessibility, Academic sufficiency, which is the number of academic classrooms for enrollment. Program sufficiency, which is the presence of specialized room in course spaces like gym, art, music. Um, and instructional technology, which is your Wi-Fi access, power, infrastructure, and adequate classroom technology. So all Reading schools received the highest rating in those categories, um, which I think is a testament to um, our facilities department, our technology department, um, you know, in the things that we're trying to do to maintain the buildings that we, that we have. Um, in the other category, which was the building condition rating, four of the seven schools, Barrows, the high school, Eaton, and Parker, received a rating of one, so that's the highest score. Coolidge and Birch Meadow received a rating of two, and Killam received a rating of three. So the criteria in this category include what's called a building analysis, which is your roofing, exterior windows, boilers, HVAC, structural soundness, exterior doors, exterior walls, interior floors, interior walls, etc. Um, your electrical service, your electrical lighting, um, a site condition analysis, which is your parking lot, driveways, walkways, playgrounds, play fields, um, your drainage, your septic, sewerage, and water supply. Okay, so that brings us to really kill them um, and. You know, in terms of the strengths, as I mentioned, Killam was rated a one in the general environment uh, category. So this is a structurally sound building um, that, had, that is well maintained, has adequate space and technology um, to do the, the types of programs that we, that we have uh, in our elementary schools. 
Um, they had an updated HVA system um, and a roof replacement five years ago. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we did the Green Schools Repair Program, um, and as part of that program, we were able to, to put Killam in and get 50% uh, get reimbursement at the time for those two things. It also has a fully addressable, brand new, within the last two years, fire alarm panel with smoke and heat detection. Um, that isn't a fire suppression unit. Uh, it does not have a fully sprinkled building, but in terms of life safety, you, to have the, the fire alarm panel is actually a higher priority because that saves, saves lives, whereas your fire suppression unit saves property. So there's a difference there. Um, and we do have two other buildings, school buildings, that do not have fully fire suppression, which is Joshua Eaton and Birch Meadow. Um, they are just partially fire, partial fire suppression. And that, and that needs to be underscored because the the box of the, the system, the warning system, Correct. is the important yeah. piece. Uh, and I, I think that was, what did you say, a couple Two years, years ago. ago? Two years ago, we put in the new fire alarm panels, yes. Um, the security system and the procedures at Killam are very similar as the other five, four elementary schools. Um, so the same security system exists, the same procedures that we use for safety and security exist. Um, as the same as the other elementary schools. And all of our schools are part of a comprehensive integrated pest management policy. So if we do have little critters in the school, whether it be bugs or, or other things, we have a process that we use um, to address any of those types of things. Now, Killam does have some building deficiencies, and we know that. So handicap accessibility, um, it was built in 1969 when um, the laws were much different. Um, the lead in the water, which we have mitigated with bottled water um, for the time being. There are aging windows and doors which go along with the fact that the building was built in 1969. Um, and there, there are some other, because of age, there are a few other areas that need to be updated and renovated. Um, I've been doing some extensive research and will continue to do research on the MSBA process. Um, there are certain criteria that, that MSBA requires for any school to be put on a list um, and they range from uh, enrollment issues to uh, loss of accreditation to something that's uh, a building that's structurally unsound and safe unsafe for students to be in um, something that's going to prevent overcrowding because there's a bubble coming up in enrollment um, short-term enrollment growth uh, or racial imbalance. Those are some of the categories that MSBA uses as their criteria. So um, I'm going to continue to do research on this, but I, I want the community to know that the Killam is, is very structurally sound. We have spent um, significant funds over the last several years through the capital plan to keep it updated and addressed um, in the areas that need to be addressed. Because uh, I know there's some things out there that um, maybe some misconceptions about Killam, but um, it is a it is a structurally sound building. Yeah, yeah just um, appreciate all that work, and I know uh, John, you also referenced the webinar that you attended over the weekend. Yeah, right. Yes, um, you know, gathering some more of this information, and I think it's really important because people it's very hard for people to understand. Um, sort of as we go into this um, budget season, and we're talking about operating budget that capital is, is a different um, bucket of money. But I think people need to understand that over, I mean, I, I, I was first on the committee in 2003, my kids attended that school. And over these years, it was, very, it, it's a good solid building. It has some, the AD, the uh, uh, handicap accessibility is probably the, the single biggest issue, but we have really maintained that well. Um, it, it, it is a building that we will, or not, I might not be on the committee, I don't think so, but um, you know, that, that as a community, we're gonna want to do something about in terms of um, you know, perhaps a bigger renovation at some point in time, but in the meantime, we have always prioritized the projects. And I think Joe Huggins does really, he's been in the district a long time, he does an outstanding job with the inventory and doing the inspections and keeping track of it. So I think um, 
concern people had was if we passed an operating override, then we would forget about this building. And there's, there, that's just, it, that's not true. We're not forgetting about the building. The, as I, um, I talked with Ms. Dowd today, the capital plan, uh, town capital plan has a TBA in the number and it does not have a, a date, a year. And that's because we just don't know where that is. We're going to keep doing projects that we need to do to maintain the building. We don't know where that is yet. And it would be, it would create perhaps, you know, the wrong impression or misinformation if we put that in some out year. So I think, um, you just know, maybe. Just put a footnote to exactly. that. Exactly. Yep. That's what there'll be a footnote. Um, well, we don't want to put a year because then <coughs> it's expected. Right. That that, yeah. Exactly. So, and I, I think if, if any parents uh, or anyone in the community has questions, they should certainly feel free to call us. And I think Dr. Dart's going to publish something. Yeah, uh, I, I, will put, I will put something together. Basically, what I, what I read tonight, I will yeah. put something together. Yeah, in a week or so. I can't remember. Uh, was, was Killam part of the performance contract? Yes, that was the HVA. That was. Yeah, yeah. That, that was what we did with Killam so at the time. That's important. Yes. Yes. That's that's my report. Sandy, you're up. All right. <laughs> Twice in one year, I get to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so we had our first parent university in in October. Um, it was a huge success. Um, we had probably about 150 people, maybe a little bit more than that, come, which I was pretty happy about because it was, what, 80 degrees <laughs> out and sunny, so yeah. I was happy. Um, but it was, we had a really good variety of workshops. Um, we had two workshop sessions. Parents could go to pick one of the work classes um, in the first workshop session and go to that and then go to the, to the second workshop session um, as well. So one of the biggest um, issues for parents was picking what they wanted, what they wanted to go to because they wanted to go to a lot more than just two. Um, so, um, you know, we ended up, um, everything went very well. The keynote speakers, David and Aaron Walsh, were fabulous. Um, everybody liked them. Um, we also were able to have a lot of participation from staff um, here at the school. Um, some of them gave workshops um, themselves. Erica McNamara also, you know, gave a workshop. Um, Kristen Morello did the. Um, D during the break, she provided uh, food and coffee and things like that. Um, so it was that was really great because she had the opportunity to interact with parents, which she never has the ability to do. So it was it was actually um, I think some of the benefits of having this were more than what we expected. Um, parents were happy to be able to connect. Um, that was some of the feedback we got. Um, you know, they were happy to have professionals providing information about different topics that interested them. Um, so it was, I, it was really successful across the board. They won another um, parent university. Um, we were, I was lucky enough to get, write a grant and, you know, writing Cooperative Bank supported it, uh, $10,000 um, to support it. So. Um, you know, we, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, but some of the, you know, high, some of the, um, feedback that we did get, um, the overall experience, um, was overwhelming, overwhelming 97% of people who responded to it. Uh, the survey said that they had an excellent or very good, um, experience at parent university. Um, so. I mean, you can't really ask for much more than that, but um, but it went very well. So thank you. Um, I read through the comments, and it is just really amazing because yeah. the, the negatives are actually really positives because they're saying I would have 
the sessions were duplicated, so I could have been right. attended a like, session uh, in the afternoon, or um, that sort of, geez, I wish I had had this opportunity. My kids are a little older, sort of like, yeah. you know, wanting, and then people saying, oh, I'd really like to see this again, but focus on the, you know, t- yeah. maybe teen issues as their children um, age and grow up. So, um, I, and the survey responses are great. Do you, do you know what, how many people answered the survey? Was it at the well, what I did um, to get to make sure that I did get some of the surveys filled out is we had some donations for door mm-hmm. prizes. Um, so at the end of the second session, I had everybody come back to the pack and fill out the evaluation. And they filled out the eva- evaluation. We put a ticket in for the door prize. So that's how I got as many as I did. (laughs) Otherwise, I don't know if I would have gotten all the feedback, but. And clearly people took the time to do the evaluation because they wrote comments. Yeah, they they wrote a lot of comments. Um, I wish I could have attended one. Yeah, it was, they, a a lot of, it was a really good opportunity for the district to, um, you know, provide information to parents that you know, maybe had to do with the school, like um, facing history and ourselves was one of the workshops. So we, there was a lot of, a lot of um, information presented also before we even put together anything for the parent university. I sent out a survey and I got quite a bit of feedback about that. And that's how some of the topics that I picked for um, this, I was able to, to hone in on some of that. So to say I've really loved going to the Blue Ribbon conferences and feeling what I take away really gives me a sense of what the power of professional development is for our teachers as well and so when you were doing this I was thrilled that other parents would also have this opportunity because it's a catalyst for learning more and thinking outside the box and Mm -hmm. when kids come home with certain assignments or are saying something about a classroom it gives some to understand, it gives some other tools to understand what's right. being said and read between the lines, and um, I think that's wonderful. So, and and like Mrs. Webb, I read through these and I was really impressed by the care people took in thinking about their responses, um, because at the end of these workshops, even if you're getting bribed to yeah. turn them in, which I see nothing wrong with, yeah. um, it's still hard to be thorough in your comments right. because you're in a rush. You want to get home. Mm-hmm. I did have a question. I think I remember that you said you provided child care Yes, we did. We did. So my extended day staff um, provided the care. We also had some high school volunteers who needed hours. So they were in the field house. We did it in the field house. They were in the field house as well. We provided enrichment. Um, So we had somebody come and provide enrichment so they would be thoroughly entertained, um, you know, all morning. So I feel like that is a huge piece of it, too, because there are parents that um, may not be able to come um, if we didn't provide the child care. So um, but that went really well um and we definitely you know my staff they're all trained and they know how to manage everything so i felt very comfortable with that piece of it um and how they were doing that uh when is the you have one get another one scheduled for the future um i think we're gonna going to do it around the same time again um you know one I think in October, probably the third weekend in October again, um, because once we were thinking about November, but the first weekend in November is SATs and we're a testing site. Um, and then it's, um, it, it, then we have a holiday Veterans Day. So it, we're probably gonna keep it at the same time um, again next year. How did the budgeting work out for it? great it was spot really spot on um we either the biggest piece cost to it is is obviously going to be the keynote yeah um and that's a really important piece to this because that's your introduction and that's the one thing parents 
um, you know, if, if you want to get them engaged right out, out of the gates, that you want a really good um, keynote. And they were awesome. Um, so they also provided workshops, too. So that was, they each did a workshop, and the, the parents loved their workshops. Um, so it, you know, I feel like that is an important piece of it. Moving um, into the next parent university, I'll, I'll be writing a grant again. And I Who did um, the work? I think that's the important piece is this was cost neutral to the operating yeah. budget. It was all grant funded, so right. there was no expenses right. yep. incurred exactly. within the budget. So. Yep. Who did the uh, one on preventative biomechanics? Oh, <laughs> um, Dr. <laughs> Bo you want to? Boyge, uh, he, I don't even know how to say his last name. He, um, Tom Zaya, he, he, he somehow got referred to me through Tom Zaya and, you know, I, yeah, I obviously didn't attend any, any of them, but it, it, he, I don't, I think it would be, things like that are helpful when it's provided in a different context, probably, yeah. um, you know what I mean? No. Um, but. I think, you know, some of these topics um, the parents are really interested in because they're hot topics, um, and there's things, too, that go on, you know, that can go on in the district that can be hot topics, like the, the I know a lot of parents are, I talk a lot about, you know, the, the nutrition and the, you know, so next time we do this, uh, Kristen Morello is going to give a workshop on nutrition. So. It's a really good way to get to help answer a lot of questions parents have um, because sometimes they make assumptions and you know it's great to have staff come in and do it. Yeah. Sandy, thanks for this report and the, the detailed responses in the packet are really helpful. So a lot of work, we appreciate it. What did you learn? Like, what was your takeaway from the experience? What would you do the same next year, and what would you do differently next year? Um, I would keep the workshop, I would keep it the same, the structure of it. Um, I think it's really important to have the workshops be no more than an hour long. Um, I know some people would want them to be longer, but I think it's really hard to do more. Um, you know, I think one Saturday morning is plenty. Um, I also liked Main Street with, you know, having the different um, groups on Main Street because, again, that gave um, parents the opportunity to interact with community, and they all like that. Um, so I don't think I would change the structure of it. I think I would probably look at some of the topics um, that we included and maybe think about it differently, um, you know, maybe send out another um, survey, what do parents want, you know, and the one coming up for the next, for the fall, um, you know, and kind of go from there. I feel like the next parent university, we're probably going to have a lot more parents um, because I know this got such a very good overwhelming response that we probably will get more people. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Two questions. One is, you said there were about 150 yeah. people. Yeah. Yep. What would be the capacity of a workshop a, a day like this? Well, one of, that's a good question. One of the things that um, obviously would be hard is space. There's only you know there's a distance learning room. There's a pack. So that, that is going to control some of of who, how many people we can have in a workshop. Um, if it's a really we had people pre-register, so I had a good idea of which workshops were going to have the most people in it. However, parents change their minds and go to different things, which is fine. Um, but, you know, we, we used the PAC, for example, for David and Aaron Walsh's workshops, which was good because their workshops had a lot of people in them. Um, you know, we used the distance learning room for one of the larger workshops, too. So. I think for a, a well a workshop that's well attended, I would run it twice, or, you know, session one and session two, to give parents the opportunity to go to it. I mean, you know, we would try to accommodate. Um, we also had one in the library, too. Um, sort of related, can I have a question? Yeah. Um, what 
is we have a lot of um, education's really changed. Mm -hmm. And have you considered including seniors in this kind of an education day? I don't know how many you'd get, but I'm wondering if there might be seniors or grandparents or who are being yeah, asked that's actually to a good point. schools yeah. that might want to understand better what happens. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Are, are being faced by parents. Yeah. I, do, I think that's a really good point, and, and you know, we, I know when we did this, I did have people, staff, some of the staff um, wanted to come. I had people from other, outside of Reading want to come, um, you know, and obviously we, I think, yeah, we, I would absolutely, you know, I think that's a really good point, um, that there probably are some topics that would interest seniors. Um, you know, to get to know our district better and get to know what's going on in the community better. Yes. Yeah. Quick question. So was the, talking about, you know, the types of workshops that were interested in participants, was, I assume there was a gender imbalance, but we should maybe make assumptions. Like, was it 50% women and 50% men? Or was Actually, it Actually, I'm, there were a lot of fathers and yeah. a lot of mothers. There, so I'm going to say it was, was yeah, was it was, uh, there were a lot of fathers there. Yeah. That's great. Lots. That's excellent. Because what they did, like um, the mother would go to, it, like if two workshops were at the same time, one would go to the, the so. Uh, and was there any fee for that? For, no. Uh, and the child care was free. 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 It's, uh, it was so all free. This is, it's amazing. It was all free to the parents, and child care was free, so there was absolutely no cost to the parents. And that was a Reading co-op grant? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Yes. Did you have to fit this in with your regular yeah. responsibilities? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you You're so welcome. much. Mm -hmm. she's, she's been planning this for, oh, oh, since for a while. June? Yeah. Cute. They had, May, yeah, they John helped me a lot, so. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was, it was fun. It's time for it to die. Yeah, it was, was a lot of fun. Was there, a, where did the model for it come from? Or is it just, you guys said, we got to do this and sort of. Um, There's a couple other school districts that have tried this. Burlington and Wakefield mm -hmm. have, have done it in the past. I am um, a Burlington resident, so, and my kids go to, I have a high schooler and a middle schooler, so I went to the one in Burlington to see what that was all about. And so when I went to that one, when I, we originally we got the notification that they were going to do this, I forwarded it to John and Craig, and I'm like, this is a great idea. And then I went to it to see what, I was like, this is, this is cool. You know, they had a lot of information, things that, you know, as a parent, you might you'd be interested in um so w what we did you know is figured out um how you know how are we going to pay for it who do you know things like that but um but it was actually a lot of fun um you know to, to put together and it definitely is fun to be there during the day because with extended day everybody knows that i'm sandy but i don't know a lot of the parents so you know, it, it also is an opportunity for me to, to get to, to know some of the parents as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Is that just the, the one year grant or? Yes. Grant writing again. Just going back to the but, but they, uh, we, we uh, received some preliminary information. They, they're very they interested very in continuing the partnership. Yes. Yeah. They were excellent. very impressed with it overall, so we did get really good, good feedback. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Good night. Happy good Thanksgiving. Good night. Thank you. So we're hopeful we will continue the partnership. Be with interesting them. to know what maybe someday what uh, mm -hmm. if we did want to continue it and there wasn't a grant I'd be curious what what tuition would be for something like that uh, mm -hmm. just because you don't want to just get rid of it because you don't right. have a right. grant maybe right. it's still something we'd want to 
Well, yeah. and, and entertain the, uh, it depends what the capacity is, whether you, you allow, like we do with Blue Ribbon, where you bring people in that are basically tuition or registration fees. Right. It could offset some of the yeah. local people's costs. But I think focusing on our, obviously on our community is Yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through some of the highlights. Um, the calendar that's being proposed is very similar to the calendar that's been proposed for the last few years. Um, so a couple of, couple of things. Um, school would begin for teachers on August 27th. They would have two days prior to students coming in, which would be August 29th. And just so the committee is aware and the community is aware that the 27th and 28th, um, those two days prior to when students start is actually in the collective bargaining agreement. Um, that there are two days prior to when right. students yep. arrive. So the first day of school um, would be scheduled for August 29th. Uh, you heard this evening from Craig um, the, the value of that no November 7th election day, uh, professional development day. So that continues to be built into this calendar, which is uh, November 6th next year. Um, in addition, there is uh, another professional development day, which is March 22nd, and that would be the annual Blue Ribbon Conference that we, that we hold here in the district. And then parent-teacher conferences would be held on the 16th. So all of those dates are very similar in time frame to the dates that we have this year. Um, we coordinate with the town on the... I'm just thinking of the election. I, I know there yes. wasn't one this year, but I don't know what April. next year is. Yes. No, I'm talking about November. Y yes. Yeah. Yes. And the town clerk has asked us on the on those years where there is an election that we not have school, um, especially the presidential year. Right. But next year is a mid-cycle election, Which so there are. I think there's a Senate race, and um, so my guess is is that this would be advantageous. <laughs> as well, because all the voting is here at the high school. Um, according to DESE regulations, we have to build in five snow days, which is why you see the school year five days longer. Um, and so, and we have averaged over the last few years five snow days. Um, so if all five snow days are used, the last day of school will be on June 21st. If no snow days are used, the last day of school will be on June 14th. Um, and just as an aside, because I know it was brought up this year, Veterans Day next year, because it falls on a Sunday, the state holiday is on a Monday, so there is no school on Monday the 12th, whereas this year that was different because it fall, fell on a Saturday. Which won't happen again. For another seven, seven years. years. <laughs> So that's the highlights of, of the, um, uh, the RTA has also reviewed this as per the collective bargaining agreement and they support this calendar. Any discussion? Yes. I'm wondering how, I know that this summer um, there was a committee that worked together to hone in on the accommodation policy and I'm just wondering what feedback you got in terms of whether it worked better um, having the Jewish holidays in and um, whether there whether it was uh, people's time was honored and what the feedback was the committee never discussed the calendar the committee only focused on the accommodation policy right but the implementation of the accommodation policy impacts how whether how it works to have the Jewish holidays as part of in school or out of school. So you passed the policy in uh, uh, September. Right. And we've Just had two Jewish holidays since then. And I'm wondering how that went. We've That's heard no issues with the way it was uh, implemented this year. Okay, and the attendance figures were? Um, very similar to two previous years when we've had the Jewish holidays. Um, the student 
absentee is up a little bit, and that's understandable. Um, and staff, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but we did have some staff. And this year we did have, uh, as part of the collective bargaining agreement, there are religious days now built in in the collective bargaining agreement for staff. So there were staff that, that took those days for religious holidays. There aren't specific days. There are that are there are. They have the opportunity to use them. To, to, use, to use them, yeah. If, yeah. if they are for if they, whatever their religious for religious yes purposes. Yes. It's not a specific day. It's that they have correct. Yes. So, so it's sort of aligned with the overall the policy, which correct. Um, it's an accommodation. Yeah. Is what it is. Yeah, it's an accommodation. Yeah. That we now yeah. have the teachers. Yes. Yeah. I um, my concern is actually the backwards. Thing. The attendance not going, the absences not going up more is more concerning to me because what I hear from people is the concern that students are too afraid to miss their classes, which sets up the conflict between their religious practices and taking the day to go to temple and um, being at school. And so the um, veracity of the implementation of that accommodation policy makes a big difference. You know, sure. whether kids are being encouraged to take that day to go be with their family to be at Temple as opposed to <coughs> worrying about what they'll miss. That's So I think the way the policy was rewritten this year, which the committee approved, was it did just that. There was no homework assigned for any student in the district on those days. There was no tests, quizzes, or projects assigned or due on those days. Um, there was no new teaching material going on. That was made pretty clear on the new, the newly approved policy. And the feedback from the teachers? I've was? heard no negative feedback from this year's policy. Implementation. I have actually a comment on that topic and then I wanted to switch gears if it's okay. The, um, my comment on that topic is anecdotal, so admittedly, but I have two children in the district uh, they go to two particular schools, so I can't say that this is consistent across the board. Um, but several times in September, a couple times in September, both came home and said, I don't have homework tonight because it's a Jewish mm -hmm. holiday. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is helpful in two reasons. One, it means they understood why they didn't have homework that night, and it raised awareness about a religion that isn't ours. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, there's a healthy respect. So from my perspective, admittedly anecdotal, very limited, um, there did seem to be good implementation, and it led to some positive outcomes. Yeah. Oh, and I have one more. Yes, thank you. Um, I also think that given the, the issue of anxiety that we have, this is certainly not the reason we did this policy, and I wouldn't say at all, but a, a benefit is I don't think it's the worst thing every now and then for kids to just not have homework, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not it's an un, it's not an intended consequence, consequence or a reason to, to do it, but it is nice for kids to get that break throughout the year. So another benefit. So what I wanted to talk yeah. to you a little bit is... Um, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. Switching gears. Um, is November. Um, I, you know, I know this, we've heard from people who struggle with all of the kind of random days off in November. So I just want to clarify with Mr. Martin that that election day, you do continue, you do anticipate that you're going to continue to be working with other districts on that day. That's one of the rationales for taking yeah. election day. I, I heard what you said about the town clerk, and there is a mid-cycle mm -hmm. election, but I there's think, also... I think clearly that's up to each community school committee, but what I'm hearing is the number of communities that are choosing that day as an incident has mm -hmm. been growing okay. for that reason. Yeah. And so then obviously Thanksgiving Veterans Day, can't move those. Mm -hmm. um, so that leaves the 16th, and I am, my memory is that that's tied to report cards and... Those are the, conferences, yeah. Yeah, they're conferences. So you move it to October, say, the teachers and parents don't have enough data, you move it to December and it's too far after report card. So I'm assuming that date is actually pretty hard based on reporting cycles. Am I that correct? Is, that is that? correct. All right, well then I don't have a solution. Just thought I'd talk it through. November <laughs> November's always been a difficult month educationally because of holidays and the um, the conference day. Yeah, yeah. I feel, I, I yeah, I wish I mean, there were an easy solution for it. The election day in service day added to what was already, but essentially because every other year or certainly every years we were being asked anyway it seemed to be consistent for those districts so. I do like I do like the consistency of if we're going to take election day off of year of establishing that yeah. and having it is 
I, I do think that's preferable to every four years having it off. And, and I assume on the off years you do something in October. And it, and there is an argument to be made for consistency in the community just getting used to how this looks. Thank you. So I have just two, um, two issues. One is um, in September. I think initially when we, um, well, this is way back when we started before Labor Day and, and worked with the teachers and, um, you know, the, the, the two days before, we did not have the Friday before Labor Day off. We only had the Monday, at least for one of the years. And then we added the Friday before. And John, um, you can sort of correct me or add to this, but Part of that rationale was the teachers are getting their two days in service. There's a lot of training um, that has to be done with them um, and, and professional development. Um, so a lot of requirements and compliance stuff that goes on. And then the, the students get basically two days or the younger kids get a day and a half, I think. Is that correct? Uh, um, yes, that's, that's correct. Elementary, it, the Wednesday is a right. short day. Yeah, it's an early and day. So yeah. The idea there is it just sort of gets them going and then they, you know, step into, um, you know, a four-day week, a two-day week, a four-day week, a five-day week. So they sort of get going. Ease back into the school Right. Year. And the Friday, um, I think we felt at the time when we initially did this that there were quite a few other districts that, that started before Labor Day that did the Friday holiday. When we first made some shifts to that, and again, this is prior to 2010, I think. Um, it was, it, we, we were like one of the districts that didn't have the Friday and other districts did. So I just wondered if you could, um, if you have anything else to add to that rationale. But that's, in my mind, it seems like a lot of families do like to get an early jump on any travel for that weekend and that affords them. Yeah, the them. Friday has never seemed to be a concern. It is a work day for, um, for 52 week employees. Mm -hmm. Um, so the buildings are open, um, but it is that's not seemed to have been an issue okay. with families. That, that's never come up. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more. Compromise for people who would rather wait till after yeah. the to start. I mean, there's a group, a significant right. group, and that they come in years past to speak as yep. well. Right, and that was so part of it. It was part of that compromise because yeah. people, you know, really enjoyed that thought of that Labor Day weekend as the last weekend, so it just gave families a little bit more ability to, to take advantage of that. Um, I have a, a, a follow-up to that. It's just, you know, sometimes, and I think Jean was highlighting it in November, um, but we have the Wednesday half day, which as we know from some of our discussions last year, you know, um, prior to the um, failed override, you know, we have been talking about how do we put that time back in learning and, and um, you know, build the um, planning time back into the teacher's day at the elementary level. And I really think that that would go a long way to addressing some of the things that where we end up, we have a professional de development or a, a parent-teacher conference and service day, and for, especially for elementary parents, that gets like added to the Wednesday half day, which may already be challenging for them to manage. And, and while that, that's something that you know, I think about, I think you know, more important to me is the um, ability for us to provide the teachers the time to do their planning and collaboration and to get that time on learning back for our students. So you know, hopefully that's something that we can look at in the future. Well, um, what are you referring to, the November day? or No, the Wednesdays, putting the... Well, that's a collective bargaining thing. Right, right. Well, it's a more of a, a budget. It, it's something that, that it's we both. had it's on It's collective table. bargaining and it's a budget. Right. It's something we had on the table, but we, you know, we weren't able to move it forward. And I just think it puts us... It is part of the issue when you have a week and you've got the Wednesday half day and then you have something else on top of that. Um, does make it a little challenging sometimes for the elementary parents. Linda, just, oh, I'm sorry. I, I had a question about the history. Uh, to Elaine, what you were saying, the history of the the rest of August school, right? So the 29th and 30th, those the you know, day plus and two days of the day plus in elementary school and then two days in, in other schools. Have we had discussions in the past with school committee when this was for the, the history of this and just kind of how teachers and students view this, having these two days 
right at the beginning of the year in August and then having a very long break and then coming back after Labor Day as opposed to like some districts choose to start just after Labor Day for students. I'm not talking about the teacher and service days, just for students. And I, you know, they, they tack it on in June very often, right? They'll have a couple extra days in June after the snow days if you need the snow days. Have we, have we debated the, the benefits or, you know, costs of that and, and kind of, could someone just give me the, the quick history of that? Why did we come out where we did? And anyone who's here. I can, well, I yeah, no, I can certainly. Yeah. Um, right, most, I, I mean, what I hear is anecdotal um, mm-hmm. from yeah. from staff. And staff like the fact that they students come in for a couple of days that week, then they ease into a four-day week the following, and then they go a full week the third week. So mm-hmm. from an educational standpoint, they can get a lot of their... The things that you need to do the first couple of days, school, the routines, the procedures, you know, all of the things, the nuts and bolts things that you have to do, mm-hmm. those get done in those first two days. So right after Labor Day, you come back, you hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have a shorter week, it's a four-day week, and then you mm-hmm. hit a full week. So staff have always liked that, and then they are able to ease into it from a teaching perspective as well. Okay. Um, when do we start the... August, the two days in August. Oh, this is. I was I was a teacher when we were down, so quite a while. I think it's even before that. Right, Pat was the superintendent. Did we? I just. Do we ever? Have have we ever looked at attendance rates? Attendance rates are very strong on those two days. Okay. You talking about student attendance? Yes. Yeah, it's very strong. Okay. Just just to fill that out. That's good to hear because I've heard people say, "Oh, you don't have to go back and." They don't start teaching until after Labor Day, so that's good to hear. That. Yeah, no, no, it's very strong. It's in the high 90s on both days, 90%. There, the high there 90%. was a big debate when this was done. Were you also, because it was between 2000, uh, I was on the committee from 2003 to 2010. We did it in that time frame, and I don't remember which year. We discussed and it again. It was a, a significant discussion, yeah. and there were some pieces of it, too, that said the students are sort of more ready to learn um, in September mm-hmm. than they are in June. June. So the okay. additional days in, in June mm-hmm. tend not to be as efficient and effective um, for the learners. Okay. And so that was you know, one of the issues. Um, but it, it, there was a lot of debate, and it was a big shift. And mm-hmm. I think you know, overall, the, um, it works really well academically and for our district. And I think since then, more districts have have done that. I don't know if they've shifted. Yeah, I'm not know this. I don't know the split, but there is still some that start after Labor Day. Mm-hmm. Um, I know North Reading does. Um, I think Andover does. Mm-hmm. Uh, starts after Labor Day, so there are a few. Um, it's I would say it's pretty evenly split. And yes. they often have a stressful time come June when we've had snow days because they're threatened with going into July, which they can't do by contract, so right. they're looking at how else they're gonna fill in the time because they have to have their 180 yep. days. Uh, but I was going to say that um, what, what Mrs. Webb said in terms of the um, effectiveness of learning and teaching mm-hmm. in August when kids are excited to come to school mm-hmm. as opposed to in June when they're really fried um, the teachers are fried, it's hot, it's, it's just a very hard time to make the learning time count. And so um, that plus if snow days have been added, it's very difficult. I've also heard the discussion, I, was, um, I think we revisited it when I first came back on mm-hmm. in 2014 and we talked about the easing in to school, like you were mentioning, with the two days, then the, mm-hmm. the four days, and then that that w- is actually very helpful. We did get a letter from a parent concerned about the anxiety caused by going for two days and then having a break. Um, but that, I, yeah. I just think the easing in um, a small dose and then a bigger dose of the school there might be anxiety anyways, but I'm, I, I like that this is the, the way to ease in, and I worry about time on task that's not effective time in June. Jane. I, 
feel like tonight's my night for sharing anecdotal information, but this is anecdotal, but I'll add it to uh, my experience back when I was teaching, which was 10 years ago, but my district had a similar calendar, and I loved it. I was teaching at the high school level, and I loved that first day we did some introductory activities, here's the syllabus, here's the expectations, here's the policies and procedures, do a writing assignment tonight, mm -hmm. hand it in tomorrow, I had the long weekend to read all my students' writings, get calibrated, and then you just hit the ground running on Tuesday. So I found it, as a, as a high, at the high school level, just a really effective way to get all the administrative stuff out of the way, so you can really start teaching that first week in September, because there's a lot of administrative stuff you have to do, mm -hmm. just do. Um, and then my other experiences as a parent of elementary students, um, it's subjective, and people will disagree, but I, you know, if you have a six or a seven year old coming off of summer vacation, which when you're that young feels like an eternity, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, going back to sitting in a classroom is a huge adjustment. So I personally like the two days of it, then four mm -hmm. days to relax. And I, li I think the ease in it can be very beneficial for anxiety and just adjusting for younger students. So it's anecdotal, but that's my take. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also think it's important to understand the um, broadened definition of, un of education and learning, that it's not just time on task with math or English. It's also building the community in your classroom that's going to support the learning over time. And a lot of that is what happens at the beginning. And that's as important, I think, as the lessons on um, the particular math skills or whatever it is, not in competition to it, but enabling it. <clears throat> yes. Well, thank you to everyone. That was, that was all very helpful because I didn't have all that history, but totally separate. Well, I mean, I, we seem to have forgotten that a couple of years ago, there were parents in here uh, complaining about the early start yeah. and that the school committee, I'm pretty sure, when Russo was chairman, um, moved it back and, and we're headed in the other direction. That was only two years ago. We haven't started. We, no. We've always, my kids have been in no, the system for six years. No, because of how it fell that year, it would have been, no, it wouldn't what, have the, started to like the sixth or the seventh or something. But there was that discussion. We, that, the discussion was if, as long as the month had an A in front of it, that is when we were going to start, right? Mm -hmm. In August. We've never. Start since I've been on the committee for eight years, we've never started in September since I've been here. It's been in August. We had that discussion. I think that's what I'm talking about when I first started in 2014. Yeah. We discussed it but came to the same conclusion that starting in August was better. And Caruso's not here anymore, so. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. I say that affectionately. <laughs> yes. Someone tell me why this is a bad idea. Could you do parent-teacher conferences on election day? Uh, you you can't. Um, because no, because the they, elementary, need the, they need the, the school to vote, not right? Be yeah. ready that's yet. why, right? It's not. A, I just want to make sure that's not a possibility to, to the point Ms. Baraski raised earlier. So you can't. You just phys you don't have the space to do it. Is that right? Well, you wouldn't you have the, the freshman development opportunities that day as well. But it's a space issue as well as a, you could put the PD somewhere else in theory, right? No, they just, they wouldn't be ready yet. The elementary and it's, wouldn't be It's ready a week yet. before. It's it really Tuesday versus Friday? No, no. Wait, he's saying, could you put the, the 16th? So the 16th is the parent-teacher parent -teacher conference. conference. Is the 6th, the previous Tuesday, is election day. And so I'm just asking, could you do parent-teacher on the 6th, have school on the 16th, and take a day off of June? The elementary would not be ready on the 6th to have parent-teacher conferences. Okay. And I believe you would still have to make up that day because of the contract. Aren't, aren't those five days? Well, so you, could, you, could, you could put it, it somewhere else. Like like put it in, in June, yeah. right? Oh, you're but just I, saying do it in June. Do, do an in-service in June at the end the when the kids are fried, as you said. The additional yeah. so space issue, though, is that then you would have all of the parents, if you put the parents in, coming to the campuses well, especially this campus, right, for parent-teacher conference type stuff when it's election day. And they, I mean, the goal there is to... Right, yeah, you wouldn't be able to have both parent-teacher conferences and, and especially and a presidential election, election. yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. So that, I think, is the space conundrum. So do we have a motion? 
Yes, we do. Yes. Just, just also in answer to that, I think the effectiveness of professional development is also being able to use it with your children, with your students. So if you put the professional development in at the end of the year when the teachers are tired and they're not going to be use, able to use it much with the kids that are in their classes then, then you're having them engage in June for next fall. So I'm not sure also the timing of maximizing the impact of the professional development time by putting it in June. Just my opinion. Okay. Are we ready for it? Yeah, oh, we already read. That's right, we already yes. read. Any, any, all those in favor? Five, zero. And now we'll first reading, um, do you want me to do the motion first? Yes. Move to accept the first reading of revised policy JICFV, bullying prevention. Is there a second? Second. And the. Oh, do we want to start reading? Start reading. <laughs> you want to? I'll start reading and you can say. Mrs. Webb, would you like me to? Uh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, okay. we're asking. <laughs> School Committee Policy JICFB, the Reading Public uh, Bullying Prevention. The Reading Public Schools endeavors to maintain a safe learning environment where students can yes. achieve. Move that we abstain from the reading and move on to the discussion. Yes. No paper. offense, you were doing it beautifully. Nice. <laughs> Five zero. Dr. Dari. Um, thank you. Um, <coughs> This is actually has two parts to it. Uh, tonight you're uh, doing the first reading on, on the uh, JEI CFB. Where this originated from is, and I, I have put a letter from um, Michael Joyce, who is our student services legal counsel at your, at your desk. Um, every two years we are required to update our bullying prevention plan as uh, stated in the, the bullying prevention law. And as part of that review, I always have our legal counsel review it to make sure that, that we're following all the procedures uh, with any updated information. And during that process, um, Attorney Joyce stated that there should be a shift in the school committee policy. Um, so tonight, you have in front of you the current policy and the suggested revised policy. I didn't redline it because it's really two different policies. Um, it actually would have not made any sense to you. So that's why you have two separate documents. Um, the one that says draft is the one that you're doing a first reading on tonight. And then a couple pages later is the current policy. Um, what Attorney Joyce is suggesting is to shift the policy um, so that it is truly just a policy and the actual uh, implementation language is put into, which it already is, but is put into the bullying prevention uh, plan. So there's some reasons for this. First, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing from Attorney Joyce's letter, by delegating the development of the uh, bullying prevention intervention policy, the superintendent, it allows the district to respond to changes to the law expeditiously without having to go through the slower process of school committee approval. Second, by delegating the oversight of the development of the plan to the superintendent, it preserves the school committee's traditional role in establishing policy, uh, which is consistent with several of other of Reading's school committee policies. And third, because the bullying prevention plan is required to be updated by all schools biannually, in accordance with the statute, the delegation of the oversight to the superintendent will permit the district uh, with consultation from relevant constituencies to meet this requirement more efficiently and effectively. Um, it does not change our process. It doesn't change the way we address these. Um, it just makes it more of a policy versus an implementation document. So this is our first biannual uh review of this? 
No, the bullying prevention plan we've actually had in place right. uh, since 2013 when the law was originally passed requiring us to have a bullying prevention intervention policy. Um, and we are required every couple of years to uh, update it. And that was part of the two, two, 2013? Yes, so we've done so it, we did it in 15 time. and now this is 17, yes. Yeah. Um, I think this is a great idea and I would be an advocate for any opportunity we have to separate out policy from procedure to take it because I think it is cleaner, I think it is better. Um, and I thought Attorney Joyce's um, memo was really compelling. So I think it's a really good idea. Yes. I had a question about the definition of bullying, which is in two places. Um, and I'm just, I want to, I have a question about one paragraph in here. It's on page 19 of the plan. And it's on page 25 of the handout. So it's the, you go to page 19 of the plan. It says definition bullying prohibited. Yeah, it says 19 in the lower right corner. Um, Not all the pages are numbered. Yeah. Uh, the, plan, the plan is numbered, so yeah. that's yeah. what's... The plan. Okay, this is the plan. Okay, page 19. Okay. So the question, and I mean, you can update us later if need be, but so the paragraph number one under section A, the definition of bullying, right, means dot, dot, dot. So that paragraph agrees with the statute, MGLC, Chapter 371, et cetera, right, that's cited. And it also agrees with Appendix B of the policy. So that's good, right? So Appendix B of the policy, page 25, definition of bullying. It's got bullet points instead of Roman numerals, but otherwise it's the yeah. same, right? Everyone follow? So I'm, I'm good with that. It's this paragraph in the plan on page 19 that follows that paragraph that I want to understand. Where did that come from? Because to my reading of this, it's, it's the paragraph that starts with the behavior must interfere with, and then it goes on, right? So to me, that paragraph limits the statutory definition of bullying, and I want to know why we have a more narrow definition. If, that, if this is what that paragraph does, why do we have a more narrow definition of what bullying is in our plan than the Massachusetts general law has in the law? So just, it, it may come from a different section, but chapter 71, section 37O, subsection A of Mass General Law says, as far as I can tell, quick reading again, as far as I could tell in a quick reading, it agrees with what you have in paragraph one there. It agrees with what we have in the policy for the school committee. So I'm good with the policy, the JICFB policy, that's correct. It's this extra paragraph. Did that come from somewhere else in the law? I just want to make sure that's, Massachusetts law, and that's not, we're not that's narrowing the definition of what bullying is and therefore restricting the ability to enforce the law to exclude activities that would meet the statutory definition of bullying. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my one question. I will check with Attorney Joyce because okay. he reviewed this bullying prevention plan. Thank you. Um, to see. And I, I'll abstain on this if we're going to go to vote on this. I'll abstain on it because of that. We're not voting tonight. Okay. Reading, yeah. It's our first reading. Yeah, that's fine. I just need to be really clear that I know which one is the, um, I'm having a little trouble deciding with that, but I thought I was, which one is the new policy? The one that's draft. Right here. Starts on. Right there. Yeah. This. That's it. Right so there. everything else before that is the existing? Is no, it's the plan. It's after, at, no, no, the, the, the current policy is after the draft. The, car, the policy where reviewing to change That's to no, the, one the current replacing. policy, the one that currently is in place, yes. is after the draft policy. Okay. That's the one that says draft is the one that you are reviewing tonight. What is before that is the actual bullying prevention plan Here's the that we are required to have by statute. This is the current. Right. This is the draft. And the pages in front of this is the plan. Or, or just drop a footnote to where where else it is in the law. It may be somewhere else. I just want to make sure it agrees with what the statute says. Yes. Yeah. I think that I remember a conversation about that paragraph that uh, Mr. Boyven had asked about. I think it was trying to maintain the connection to the schools. 
so that it wasn't, if there were bullying behaviors that ha happened disconnected to the schools, the schools were not necessarily empowered or, or uh, mandated to intervene in those. I might be wrong, so this, but that, I'm talking about that paragraph on page 19. I think it just needs to be checked out because yeah. I think yeah, I'll, I'll check with our legal counsel. A discontinuity then in the current policy on the bottom of the page. The current policy. So after the draft, right? We have the draft, and, and that's basically two and a half pages. Again, the bullying definition, as Mr. Bobbin said, is the same. But then you have this paragraph. And in fact, it's different because one says the behavior must interfere with an employee's ability to perform his or her duties. This says the behavior must interfere with a student's academic performance or ability. Well, it says it in this too. It starts with employee, then it goes on, or with yes. a student. Yeah, it flips. It flips. That, is, that is yeah. concerning because it's another test that has to be met for it to be bullying. You, you, you know what I mean? Uh, I'll check, I'll yeah. check with Attorney George. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No. Do we have to vote on the first reading? No. Do we have a no. motion? No. We oh, we moved to no. it. No, we have a motion to accept the first reading. You have to move to accept the first reading. So we just have to accept right. the first reading. So right. This is a good first reading because we gave some feedback. Yes. We're not accepting the policy. We're just accepting the reading. Um, it was used, it's question on the language used. So I've heard recently, as opposed to using the word, um, I think we changed out of the word perpetrator to aggressor. I've also heard the term harm doer of recent. The, the language that's used here is by, yeah. is the law. Is it's, the law. It's, right. And that it's hasn't been changed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are we voting on? We're just voting just to accept, accept the, the reading. reading. Yeah, for not the policy. Okay. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, move to. Uh, oh, yeah. one more thing. We had one calendar item. Oh, okay. Oh, go. Yeah, oh, yes, you're right. Yeah. Um. <coughs> So we're asking that uh, currently we, the next meeting is scheduled for December 4th. We're asking that the December 4th meeting get moved to December 11th. Okay. Do we have to do now? Well, it's not a vote. Uh, it's just <laughs> kind of a consensus. Uh, but if you don't know now, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay with that. Yep. So we need to get this get back. And uh, we'll move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and not to return to open session. Second. There a second. Uh, roll call vote. Yes. 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 